given my talk the title, The Elusive Search for Fading and Revitalization, because the whole question about union renewal, union modernization, union revitalization has been discussed both among academics and among trade unionists for at least 20 years. Um, and the results, I think most of us would say, have been less dramatic than many of us hoped. Um, Revitalising trade unions has proved to be an extremely difficult task. What I want to say in my talk covers a number of points, um, each of which I can only deal with relatively briefly. Um, I think we have to start off by the recognition that trade unions are in most countries in a position of weakness. Um, how have they been responding to this? Um, it seems to me there are many different <coughs> responses. Um, as social scientists often say, responses are path dependent. Where you're starting from, in a sense, shapes the choices that you have in where to go. Um, effective revitalization very importantly, I see it as a question of strategy, not just of tactics. It involves both leadership and democracy, which connects with some of the points that Reinhardt made in his introduction. It also involves making a connection between theory and practice. Learning is an essential part of the process, and in a seminar organised by the Teachers' Union. I think this is not a surprising thing to say. Um, part of the process is the very difficult task of building solidarity, including international solidarity. And my final point is that revitalising trade unions involves issues of ideology, but it also involves a process of struggle. Um, Conflict is central, it seems to me, to the whole process of union revitalization. Conflict with external opponents, but also conflict within the unions themselves. There can be no soft, there can be no simple consensual route to union revitalization. So responses to, to weakness. I think it's very obvious if we compare today with 20 or 30 years ago that unions in most countries are in a weaker position than they were in the past. In general, membership has been falling and with falling membership, the financial resources available to unions have also been declining. This is reflected also in reduced bargaining power and in many countries reduced political influence as well. And in some countries there's <coughs> a lot of public legitimacy. In many countries, certainly my own, there's been an attempt <coughs> to depict unions as, in a, in a sense, defenders of a relatively privileged minority rather than mass organisations defending a large popular constituency. And I'll come back to this problem later on in my, my talk. It's also very important to say that while some academics say there are structural reasons for unions decline which are irresistible, that is not correct. There are certainly structural forces which are very adverse for union effectiveness, but decline is not predetermined. Effective responses, in principle, are possible. And so, to go back to my title, in the last 
couple of decades, there have been many attempts to find recipes for modernization and your revitalization. These recipes have often proved contradictory. Um, one of them, certainly in many countries, certainly in Germany and Britain, um, has been restructuring unions through merger. Often, merging trade unions has been as disastrous as merging corporations in the business world. It's a difficult process, often creating more problems than it solves. There have been attempts to develop trade unions as agencies providing what uh, the economists call private goods um, in order to attract members providing services of one kind or another which are only available if you join a union. Uh, union credit cards, travel agencies, insurance and so on. In the main this has not been very successful because if um, a worker wants a cheap holiday, there are plenty of other travel agencies around. Um, it's not the core business of trade unions to be selling insurance or offering credit cards. It may be a little bit of additional attraction, but it can't be the main recipe for rediscovering a role for trade unionism. In some cases, and this has been uh, very popular among some British unions, trying to survive and thrive through offering partnerships. We work with governments in creating social caps. We work with employers in pursuing the modernization and competitiveness of the company. Um, the problem here is at what cost do uh, trade unions become social partners? Social partner is a term which is very familiar in German or in French. It doesn't translate so well into some other languages. Um, many people would see a union devoted to partnership as in some ways betraying its role as actually uh, opposing what employers do or what governments do when these are against the interests of the working class. Organising and mobilisation, key elements in what's often called the organising model developed in the United States in particular, um, in a sense returning to the historical roots of trade unionism as a movement, getting people uh, acting together, asserting their interests, um, fighting, if necessary, for their rights. And I think one of the key questions unions have confronted is how mobilisation and essentially oppositional process can be aligned with a bargaining role which is also sent to trade union practice. Um, and a fifth element, also central to many of the American inspired models of new unionism, is campaigning for social rights. Um, Unions are not just concerned with what happens in the workplace. Um, workers are also citizens, they're consumers. Um, they suffer various forms of exploitation and oppression, not simply in their role as workers. And the attempt actually to mobilise around a range of interests which workers as citizens, as people have, um, is again an important element in many of the attempts of revitalisation. There are certainly success stories um, and 
it's important to note them. Um, but overall, to go back to my starting point, progress has been relatively limited. So the question is what lessons can we draw?